Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Risk On, Risk Off. Um, we are here in Dallas, Texas, and it's getting extremely hot and humid. The temperature is starting to dial up. We've had a lot of rain this year so far, so it's uh, get, getting kind of swampy, and it's getting kind of uh, hard to be outside, but I guess it's part of the, uh, the price you pay living in, in Texas in the summertime. Um, along those lines, we've talked a lot here on this program respects to what we're seeing in the marketplace in trends regarding you know, insurance and risk and what are ways that the, the market is trying to respond to help people and firms you know, transfer that risk or come up with some solutions to deal with problems. And if you rewind the clock, you know, let's just say about, say, seven, 10 years ago, the idea of cyber as an exposure was starting to percolate. People were starting to pay attention to it. Uh, yeah, it was still kind of the same. Do I really didn't need it? I don't need it that much. And back when I was uh, my prior firm, um, I remember was, I sold a, a construction uh, general contractor here, a large one, a cyber policy. And I think I was one of the first ones in the, in the industry to do it here, at least in our part of the woods, because I think there's a lot of sort of him and haw and oh, we don't need the coverage. But to that point, though, there were a lot of carriers out there who were coming into the market offering up cyber coverages. And it was very competitive rates and getting lots of terms and conditions. And there was a lot of capacity. Well, then over the years and fast forward a little bit, as we've all kind of seen, seen the stories, uh, things like uh, the Colonial Pipeline hack, um, Solar Winds hack, when the North Koreans hacked Sony, when they didn't want to have the movie, the interview came out. It just more prevalence more and more as far as how bad um, the bad, how good the bad guys are respects to, you know, locking up your, your systems, ransomware, extortion, you name it. Um, it's been like a sort of the the game as far as you know the better build a better mouse trap. You got the bad guys, you know the mice stealing it, uh, the cheese. So you come with a better mouse trap, and they get smarter, and it just sort of escalates left and right. Um, so to the point where we are now, that a lot of the initial firms who came into the marketplace to provide cyber cyber coverage have left. Um, you know, as we like to say in insurance, the first guy through the wall gets a spear in the chest. I um, mean, I think that's very much been the case in the insurance world that the first people came in trying to underwrite something from which they had no losses or lost history were taking a, a, a stab at what that exposure might be. Um, and then the actual claim started to come and the attack started to occur and they got bigger and bigger and more severe. And to the point where carriers are starting to leave the marketplace and, and, and you know, restrict, restrict conditions. And so there was a question and there might be still an issue as far as what is cyber insurance going to look like and how is the market, is it going to be available? Now, the flip side for many of you, uh, I used to work for a very large commercial property insurance company called FM Global. Uh, it was one of the largest in the world, is the largest in the world that specifically looks to commercial property. Now, FM has a model when it comes to working with their clients is that they strive to get their clients to become a highly protected risk. And by that, it means if you've got a, Fire exposure, which most buildings do, you want automatic splinter protections. If you got a, 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 you're in an earthquake zone, you're getting seismic protection. You're in a flood zone, you're going to have flood barriers as far as, or design your building so that the critical equipment doesn't get hit by a flood. You're being preventative. You're thinking about your risk beforehand. You're being proactive, using data and science to try to help you come up with um, risk mitigation techniques, building your buildings more resilient. And as a result, the marketplace likes that, carers like that, and you can get an attractive rate versus a standard commercial property doesn't have that. Well, the same sort of mentality is now starting to be developed in other parts of the insurance world, and cyber is no exception. Especially if you think about cyber, cyber is very much about data, analytics, ones and zeros, and telecommunications and, and access points. It's all about data and analytics for IT. But if there was a firm that could have a background in IT and he had sort of a proactive mentality, using the same sort of concepts, working with your clients to be proactive as far as not just placing insurance and hope nothing goes wrong, but to actually build a business model that would, you know, help reduce the exposures to these type of events, therefore be an attractive business model, and maybe therefore as a result attract capital for firms looking to invest in this area. And maybe as along the lines, there might be a new uh, way of doing underwriting for insurance that can help clients become more proactive and, and be uh, more resilient rather than just, as we like to make the joke, 
you buy your insurance and go play golf with your broker and see and hopefully see you next year. Because I think we've all kind of seen that the, the perils have gotten worse. The bad guys have gotten more complicated. So you have to be more resilient. And as I mentioned, there are firms that have come along the way that are starting to develop more techniques uh, that utilize you know, the best practices for cyber protection that hopefully their clients become more resilient. And one of those particular firms specifically is um, Coalition. And I've happened to know some people at the coalition in their business model. And specifically, the individual I wanted to join on the firm today is someone I've known for a number of years. And back in my old employment, that is Mr. Sam Weaver. Sam, welcome to the show. Good afternoon, Brian. Thank you for having me on. No, it's great to see you again, Sam. And obviously, this is a topic for the concept of cyber that impacts all industries. Uh, no one's immune. Uh, it doesn't mean if you're a construction and manufacturing or nonprofit or even governmental, which for many people like I know my network, we live in Dallas. The city of Dallas has got hit by a malware um, uh, incident, a ransomware incident. That I don't think they still have completely recovered for. And so, you know, the yeah. bad guys are pretty good at what they're doing. And so the question is, can you be more resilient to protect yourself? So looking forward to having this conversation, Sam, because I think it's a, a topic that I think many people have a lot of interest in. But yeah, before we can get into that and to where you are now and what Coalition is doing, Sam, I just you know, I, I like to make the joke, you know, I ask these people, there's an old game, you know, where in the world is uh, Carmen San Diego? So right now, where in the world is Sam Weaver? Yeah, I am based in Chicago, uh, but I'm on the road this morning. So we're, okay. uh, we're, we're traveling and looking to make it happen, Brian. Very good. I, I can respect that, sir. So Sam, tell us about your early days and like, you know, where'd you grow up in college and had this idea of getting into insurance ever get in your head? Yeah, yeah, no, great question. So I grew up in Minneapolis, um, proud, proud Minnesota sports fan, suffering Minnesota sports fan um, for 30 years. I remember the last <laughs> Twins championship in second grade. I went to college at Marquette University uh, in, uh, in Milwaukee before college. Uh, okay. Actually, I spent a lot of time, and, and during college, I spent a lot of time with family in Texas. My entire mother's side of the family is from Texas. Uh, and so um, I, I never formally lived there, but did okay. spend enough time in Dallas to answer all those questions on the internet, right? You know, you grew up in Dallas when, right? So, um, <laughs> you know, just, just, uh, just part of the, part of the experience, but yeah, I went Amen. to college at Marquette in Milwaukee, um, huge college hoops fan. My favorite sports moment was um, being in the building when uh, Dwayne Wade put up his triple double and Marquette oh. beat Kentucky in the 2003 Elite Eight. Uh, so I've, I've got that. I've got that on my list of uh, sports watching accomplishments. Um, fun, insurance was an interesting path for me. Um, I had okay. never intended to be in insurance. Um, I joined Aon um, right out of college in their management development program. Okay. Uh, and, you know, even if I didn't know what I wanted to be when I when I grew up, I knew that Fortune 500 management development programs um, gave people great rotations and a, you know, gr a wonderful opportunity to learn business and see where people might contribute, uh, might contribute greatest. So that was that was my path into the industry. Everybody's got a different path. Yeah. Uh, you know, some people are born into it. Some people choose it selectively. Um, you know, I, I wound up on the business side of it and then transitioned into in, into proper um, insurance broken and underwriting later in my career. Good. So you spent quite a bit, yeah, and you were 15 years and like, look at your, your profile on LinkedIn. You, you did a little bit of moving around. You spent time, obviously, in Minneapolis. You spent some time in Amsterdam, Los Angeles, Chicago, London. So you, you, you're getting yeah. your passport stamp for sure. <laughs> yeah, I did. So I, I, want, I wound up in the management development program. My first rotation was on the management liability side, mm -hmm. uh, right, you know, DNA, global business. The second rotation was um, was sales and marketing, and I never left. Um, I love the challenge that, uh, that that sales and marketing presented and provided. Um, I love I love the concept that you could do everything right and lose, and you could do everything. I mean, not everything wrong, but most things wrong, and and still win. Right? Still pull it off. Um, yeah. But, you know, it <laughs> re requ required consistent knowledge of the market, yeah. um, drive, curiosity. Uh, and, a, and a, a willingness to, to to be really creative to find ways to to win. So so yeah, I began in Minneapolis. Um, I had an opportunity um, through after the rotational program to accept an assignment to Amsterdam, which I did. I moved back to Los Angeles to lead um, sales and marketing operations for the region, uh, and then nationally. Um, and then um, actually, you know, was my first foray into construction, was asked in 2014 to um, to lead marketing for construction services group. I spent some time in London 
came back from there and ran a strategic cyber uh, development program. Okay. Uh, and then in 2018, our construction business asked me to come back um, and lead all commercial activities. So sales, marketing, and growth um, across the construction business. So I um, did that for, for three years prior to, prior to leaving Aon in 2021. It's really an exceptional firm, Brian. Right? No. Was, yeah. Was, yeah. Plenty, yeah. plenty of opportunities to, to learn and grow, learn and grow and, and, uh, you know, and, and build a career. Um, okay. And, you know, great, grateful and fortunate for the experience to have been there. Amen. As uh, likewise, the same, because you and I were overlapped yeah. there, you know, for sure. 100%. That's where it meant. Exactly. Absolutely. So let's kind of walk back for a second. You talk, talk about how you got the whole idea of going to work into the the cyber solutions group. I mean, how was that being put in your head when you even think about cyber at the time? Yeah. So, I mean, my first experience was actually at Ant. So I, I ran um, strategic initiatives for our cyber business and, and was responsible for um, a program that uh, developed um, what, what a, a, pro a product that's called Aon Cyber Secure, which was um, a personal cyber solution for high net worth individuals. Okay. Um, I just, you know, really, really interesting concept where you can use the resources of Aon to partner with, you know, um, you know, uh, other other companies to provide cyber protection to individuals. Um, I wanted to be close to the market, right? And I, I think, you know, one of the things that that and principles that Coalition was founded on was that all risk is digital risk, right? And so when when all risk is digital risk, then cyber starts to have implications across mul across multiple lines of business. I think the corollary to that is that um, every company is a digital company now, right? Or software will eat everything. Sure. Right? Um, you know, software applications in a vast, vast variety of industries and use cases, B2B and B2C. Um, and so when you look at the greatest risks affecting that and, and, and what the greatest risk will be in 10, 15, 20 years time, I think cyber is, is, is the highest on that list. I mean, you, know, you you mentioned it in some of your opening comments. It's just it's it's something that is that has always been been interesting to me, um, and 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 it's something that that's grown significantly um, over time. I mean, when when we were at Aon, and you, you you played a huge part in this, right? But you know, we grew our cyber revenue in the construction practice probably 10x in three years, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I I don't I don't know if that's for any factor other than you know we picked up on an industry trend. Um, you know, we, we, we put resources around it and we, and we ultimately wound up responding to client questions, which, which was, can, you know, can you help me manage this new emerging risk that I need to learn more about, um, that my board is asking me to manage, um, that the industry is, is reinforcing is important for us to manage. Amen. So towards the end, I mean, obviously you were AI a long time, but then somehow coalition came about. Tell us, talk about the story, how coalition came about. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I think, um, I, I think it came about for me for for three reasons, right? Number one is is people, uh, number number two is momentum, and then number three is the opportunity, and we'll talk, we'll talk about that. So, from a from a people perspective, I mentioned the, you know the management development program that I you know kind of brought myself into the insurance industry, and in. um, two years ahead of me in that program was a guy named Sean Rain. Uh, Sean uh, was um, was part of the founding team at Coalition. Um, I think he's employee number employee number three um, inside the inside the company, right? Um, and you know, had stayed in touch with Sean over the years, um, you know, until until an opportunity arose to to join Coalition, and had a number of different conversations with Sean. It was not an easy decision to leave Van, um, but had a number of different conversations with Sean, where he helped to outline the momentum that Coalition had. I think you know, the, the company was um, was early into the into cyber, and we can talk about that in a in a little bit. Yeah. Right. But um, you know, based on the company being early into cyber, they picked up momentum in 2021 when I made the decision to join. Um, and then I think you know the the opportunity overall. Um, what what Sean asked me to do when I joined um, was to come in and lead insurance operations for Coalition and and um, help to help the team to build out infrastructure to support the company's continued growth. Um, which is what I've been doing since I joined. Very good. So let's talk about that for a second. And obviously, I want to pause here. So obviously, everyone who's watching this, if there's a question you want to have or comment for Sam, please go ahead and place it in the bottom right-hand corner. You'll see in the screen, it says add a comment. Just go ahead and knock in your uh, type of your question and press enter. And I will see that and I'll bring it to Sam's attention. So feel free to uh, ask anything you got. So let's talk a second for um, the foundation of Coalition. And obviously, it has a very different business model than what most carriers up until now are 
as he a couple of years ago were offering. What what was the, the genesis of Coalition? Yeah, well, so so um, the the company was really formed in response to you know kind of the comment earlier, right? That that all risk is is digital risk, and when all risk becomes digital risk, then then cyber and related lines of business be, start to have outsized impact from an insurance standpoint, and start to and start, start to really have more significant need for cover. What, one thing that I think is interesting about Coalition, maybe a couple of things that are interesting about Coalition. One is that uh, you know, we've had a number of our, of, of our investors refer to us not as a FinTech or an InsureTech, but a tech fin or a tech insure. Right? Okay. You know, even, even today, two thirds of the company is in hard technology roles, right? So software engineering, data and analytics, product management, cybersecurity. Right. So, you know, the, the, the foundation of the company was, was truly as a technology company. Okay. Right? Um, I, I think what else is interesting about Coalition is where we chose to focus right off the bat. There are a lot of companies that come into, um, you know, many industries, not just cyber insurance, and focus on the largest companies. Right. You know, we're going to go whale hunting. We're going to go pick up Fortune 500, Fortune 1000, true enterprise customers. You know, enterprise is now within within our appetite. We can talk about that a bit, right? Yeah. But we started the company, and the company is you know remains at, at at its core focus on 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 providing protection for all, starting with the SME space. What's interesting today is you know even as we've scaled up over time, um, we have eighty five percent of our of our policyholders in the SME space under twenty five million dollars in revenue. Wow. Right. And and part of that is 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 based on you know the, the value proposition. Part of that is also based on uh, you know the, the the ease of ease of access and and the the, the value that we create um, for for brokers as well as um, for for different policyholders that interact with coalition. I think awesome. one where, where we where we differentiate if we can get into this a bit right yeah is uh, is providing active insurance. You know we're 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 proud to. Um, proud to have been, you know, the company that 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 brought that concept to market in 2021, right? But it's been it's really kind of been foundational to the company's uh, the end of the company's setup and go to market exercises um, yeah. throughout throughout time. Um, as we deliver active insurance, there are three different elements of that. Okay. So number one is active protection. So as we evaluate potential policyholders, we're um, scanning them as an adversary would. Right? Um, part of the company. Is um, it, it, or the company its founding team was a former NSA um, D, DOD yeah. three letter government agency resources <laughs> who provide a, you know, a really strong understanding of cyber and we code it into technology and put it into our algorithm to deliver it at scale to thousands of policyholders now around the world. So at, as we can put that together, we're scanning a company's uh, infrastructure as an adversary would. Okay. Um, we acquired a company in 2020 called Binary Edge, which had a unique capability to scan the public facing Internet and, hmm. and bring in data that we built into our underwriting platform. And so we have access to 48.3 trillion data points on companies from the, from the public Internet. Right? So whenever a company applies for insurance from coalition, we can rely on thousands of individual data points to help make underwriting decisions about that company. And we're scanning them exact, exactly as an adversary would, right? So if a burglar is walking down the street, um, they may see a two-story house on their left side, a three-story apartment building on the right side, and a coffee shop at the end of the block um, with a door that's on that, that that's not lit that can be kicked in after night, so the so the guy can can visit the cash register, right? Similarly, when we're scanning uh, a potential potential business, we look to we we rely on our data set to look for various network infrastructure challenges. So a, as we're looking at that, right, we're, we're not uh, underwriting on class of industry, right? There are a number of insurers who have backed away from construction or manufacturing or other industries, but it's our view that a company's technology stack, right, the email provider that they have in place, the firewall that they have, whether they use MFA or not multi-factor authentication, all of that is much, much, much more important to us as we as we underwrite and as we consider whether that company is is a strong risk, right? Um, versus versus uh, versus any other any other kind of um, extraneous factor like industry. Yeah, and I think that's a very good point because back in the day, yeah, when I first started getting into it and I, I joined Aon and uh, learned about cyber, and 
you had so many carriers. The, the applications maybe were a couple brief, a couple pages, weren't too, you know, robust, you know. So I think maybe it's, the underwriters didn't know what to ask for or didn't know what, the, what, what's, what constitutes a good risk versus not another risk. Um, fast forward, obviously, we all know this, what's been going on with the, the ransomware and the attacks and everything, social engineering, um, imposters as far as stealing money and getting money out of a firm. But I think what I have found so appealing or at least in, interesting about what the, the coalition model is that proactive kind of component in the sense that it's using technology that the bad guys would be using, but, you know, sort of, you know, turning the tables and trying to, one, first pinpoint or pick where a client might have vulnerabilities before coverage is placed. And then as a result, provide sort of a report roadmap. It's okay, you got this, you need to do this, this, and this before you proceed. And which I think is very, it's very, it's a different way of, it's a business model because if anything, it's it's actually trying to understand like your point, not because you're a construction, okay, we're not going to write underwrite you, but like, what is the actual robustness of your systems? And as a result, being like anything else, that's where the peril whether or not you get subject to an attack is going to be a lot based upon your network and how, <laughs> how robust it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I know that you mentioned at the, at the top of the call, your experience with FM global, you know, some others will be, will be experienced with that as well. Right. But FM global has this concept of highly protected risks, right? So FM is, is glad to ensure highly protected risks, right? Um, you know, manufacturing buildings and, and warehouses and factories that have all the latest fire protection you know, sprinklers, um, you know, all, all, all sorts of asset preservation technologies is what they is what they call it. Um, that that approach is very similar to to to, to what we're executing um, in the you know in in the cyberspace uh, based on the technology that we have. Right. I think you know if, if you look at you know the provision of that technology, I think what's what's critical too is that and, and where I think we you know one of the ways that we differentiate is that we continue to scan our book for vulnerabilities. Um, after we underwrite the client, right? So perfect example, yeah. right? You know, the move it vulnerability is making you know, pretty significant news in the in the in the cyber world and starting to actually make mainstream news. Um, w w there is a ransomware group um, out of um, out of Eastern Europe mm -hmm. that is exploiting that vulnerability to uh, to to implement a pretty significant ransom demands on, on a number of major entities, um, be it major and, and minor entities throughout the. Throughout the United States, mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we're we're actually seeing a little a little bit of this globally as well. Um, at Coalition, had the capability based on our data to scan our entire entire network when the vulnerability was announced, right, or our, our entire client base when the vulnerability was announced, and proactively communicate with our policyholders that were affected, right? Um, yeah. We provided them information on how to resolve the vulnerability, how to upgrade software how to close off that path for threat actors that may be looking to break, to get their way into networks, right? And so like we're, we're providing the, this sort of active protection even post, uh, even post bind, mm -hmm. right? That, that I think, you know, kind of sets, a, sets us apart. I think if you, if you play that out as well, you know, we're, we're able to offer, you know, an exceptionally broad coverage form and we wrap that with in-house claims and incident response capabilities. Um, so, so, you, so many carriers will pay claims. We actually wind up solving the claim. Okay. Our incident response team has recovered $15 million this year in misdirected funds wow. um, that they've brought back to the clients. And if you think about that for a bit, right, when the funds are recovered, right, we've solved the claim. We've not just paid the claim, which has really positive implications on our loss ratio, which has sure. really positive implications um, on, on, on overall pricing for our customer base. And which creates this, this just a you know a, a reinforcing flywheel um, throughout um, you know throughout the business um, where we get more data, we get better results for customers. That that gets us more data to help keep us ahead of the game from a cyber standpoint. No, and I think that's you know it's it's as we like to say in the world of you know, enterprise risk management or even like um, business continuity planning, you just can't just put the plan on the shelf and let it sit there. It's it's a continuous cycle. And what I find intriguing about this, the, the, what your business model is, is like you said, you, you do the scan, you have a you know, report card, make changes, but then from that point on, you're you're helping your clients stay robust by again the periodic scanning of the system based upon the new threat levels you've heard or the new concerns or new hacks, malware, whatever the case, or zero day hacks that have been deployed. You get here, you get wind of it, you you put your clients on notice, and then. 
if something, God forbid, something happens, you've got the ability to, to respond rather than farm it out to a third party. But you're, it's actually, it's, which I find very intriguing, it's very holistic. It's, you're very much you know, cradle to grave as far as how you're trying to support your clients. Yeah, well, and, and thank you. I mean, uh, that's that, that's kind of the goal. And 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 if you go back to our our approach to the SME space, right? The the average company at you know whatever call it you know ten, fifteen, twenty million dollars in revenue. That's a pretty significant company, right? Like they've they they've they've grown well beyond the you know the the, the single person. They de- they're deploying systems. They've got a number of, of different employees, and they you know they they have a, a fair degree of sophistication. But, but what we've seen in delivering our services to the SME space is that a lot of those companies don't have um, great, great sophistication from an IT architect or an IT, an IT architecture standpoint. Yeah. And so as they look to uh, as they look to 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 you know, protect themselves as they respond to cyber threats, what we're hearing is they really value the, the services that Coalition provides, whether it's you know from our protection capabilities, from our coverage, from our uh, you know. Um, from our response capabilities um, or from, you know, our SaaS platform coalition control, which helps to give them the tools to, to reduce risk um, through real time visibility into any vulnerabilities in their network. But I think the average SME is not, is, is not um, having challenges with their network maliciously. They're trying to do business, right? They're trying to do business. They're trying, they're trying to, to, to execute their core responsibilities and cyber threats can creep up. So the, the, the more awareness that we can drive, the more systems and tools that we can give um, policyholders to, uh, to, to ultimately reduce and resolve risk, um, you know, we believe the better they'll be over time. And Sam, I, I would think, it's, you know, you're probably, like you mentioned, you're necessarily industry agnostic, but what you want to see is a client that has, for lack of a better term, when it comes to prevention or resiliency, have drank the Kool-Aid in the sense they take it. It's not just something you place in terms you walk away, but they're, they're constantly trying to improve and stay ahead of the curve, or at least being aware of that. At least there are things can go bump in the middle of the night and try to be proactive rather than be reactionary. <laughs> yeah, 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 for, for sure. A, a company that is that is solely purchasing cyber insurance mm-hmm. uh, and, and and then neglecting their network because they have cyber insurance is kind of doing it wrong, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, we 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 see insurance as one tool in the tool belt, right? Um, but but it, it comes with uh, you know have, having you know pr- proper. Uh, you know, proper and strong IT networks, um, having having advisors that they can rely on and trust, right, and having a you know having a safe approach to to, to doing business, right. I mean, I think yeah. you know one one of the things that we're seeing is more and more important is training and awareness for across general staff, right. Um, phishing emails are becoming more and more sophisticated every time, yeah. right. And you know, I think that the the more that 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 every employee in a business can be cyber aware and 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 careful. And vigilant with respect to um, their machine being an entry point um, for ransomware, you know, for for threat actors and others. Right, I think the better those companies will be over time. Yeah, and I and I think you you touch on a key point. No matter like even back in you think about commercial property, you have a highly protected risk. But one of the things that can cause something to go wrong is the human element. I mean, it's like an example. You hear too many claims I've heard in the, the back in the day. It's still this point where you know you got special protection on this warehouse, manufacturing facility, whatever the case may be. Crew came in to work on the sprinkler system, turned it off so there wouldn't be water damage, uh, flush the lines, whatever, and do some insulation repairs. But later that night, no one, when they're done, no one goes turns the sprinkler system back on. And so that's a human element. So you had this wonderful yeah. sprinkler system that was going to extinguish the water, the fire, but it, if it can't activate, it, it defeats the entire purpose. And I, that's the kind of the same thing is you could have the great cyber po- policy and systems, but if, if your people keep on clicking on dubious phishing emails from the prince of nigeria um it's not really going to do you much good yeah well and I, I think i think the point too is that, like they, you know they're getting more sophisticated every time right yeah. so i mean it was it used to be easy to to spot a scam on the internet it is it is becoming more and more difficult there was there was just an article that came out that that, that indicated that um you know the the um the, there is a cyrillic alphabet letter a that looks very similar to the the the, le- the lowercase letter a that, okay. it, that's in your URL browser right now. Yeah. Right. Um, that's a you know when 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 the Cyrillic A replaces the traditional A, 
that's a that's a dead giveaway of mm-hmm. a phishing attempt. Mm-hmm. However, that's a really nuanced look at a URL, right? And when and when individuals are clicking on links, to, again, just attempting to do business and do the right thing, yeah. right? Um, are they going to be vigilant enough to protect against that threat? Yeah, and I've got an example here. It was in North Texas. There was a um, construction firm that does a lot of you know. Um, heavy utilities installations on you know, jobs uh, like for housing developments and buy a lot of concrete um, and they get it from a, one particular firm that's national. Um, and if in their spelling of their word, there, there's a lowercase I. Bad guys sent this email with strong tone, structure, syntax, everything fine, graphics, and it looked fine. But the email, when they went, came back and did it later, because what it was is a social engineer attack, it went back and looked at the original, that first email. Um, the lowercase i was actually turned into an L. But <laughs> if you're sitting wow. there, yeah. unless you're just like to that point, unless you're just looking at your, like closing in on your computer and like you're just going to see it, oh, okay, that's, that looks like it came from, you know, Joe over that firm. I mean, it looks fine. But then, yeah, it's to that point, just a slight little alteration you can make just to trick the human eye. It's, that's what these guys are doing. Yeah. yeah. So it's a hundred percent. Yeah. So, I mean, I, across, across the game, the threat actors are becoming more and more sophisticated, yeah. right? Which is, which is, which is why, you know, the, the, the investment in protection is, has never been more important. So Sam, you've obviously, you've been involved with cyber insurance um, since its inception. And now you've got with a business model, that's different than the traditional insurance. Where do you see cyber insurance and the cyber insurance market going in the next couple of years? Cause I still, you know, one of the words, uh, there was a book I read not too long ago when it was called, this is how they tell me the world's going to end. Uh, the woman who wrote it covered um, like the hacking communities um, for 25 years in New York Times and just wrote this book that just, you read it from beginning to end, it just, you know, puts the fear of God in you, specs to like zero day hacks that the North Koreans, the Russians and the Chinese might have access to that, you know, a lot of our infrastructure hasn't been updated as far as these, these legacy systems still might be running cobalt for all we know. Um, hmm. could yeah. be attacked, you know, and that's, you, you're only as strong as your weakest link. And if it's not, you know, so that's the whole issue as far as how vulnerable we are to having our systems, you know, being up and running. If they're down, like, you know, a couple of years ago, we had down here in Texas, we had no power for five days and, you know, the state pretty much fell apart. Um, what, is, where do you sort of see as far as the big trends or risks around the horizon respects to, you know, the cyber world? Yeah, no, it's a it's it's a good question. Um, you know, and, and if I if I knew the answer, right, I'm, I'm I I may be making that bet somewhere else. I, I can <laughs> I, I can I can I can have a, a a couple of different perspectives on it though. Right? I do I do have a couple of different perspectives on it. I think I think one is uh, you know we've seen broadly the cyber insurance market um, becoming more buyer friendly um, over the last twelve to eighteen months. Um, there are a number of theories for why that's been the case. Um, you know, I mean, theory number one is that we're, we're obviously seeing less claims or fewer claims over the, over the past 12 to 18 months. Mm-hmm. One theory on that is that um, typical ransomware um, activators and, and, and attackers um, were, were busy with the Russia-Ukraine conflict um, on, on, uh, and, and, and engaged there. Um, we have seen over the past three to four months a really noticeable uptick in ransomware activity. Uh, and, and and we're starting to see additional claims activity as well. And so, uh, you know, I think the 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 cycle of of you know relaxed um, relaxed pricing for for cyber insurance um, that's been in place for you know probably you know, and happening for you know the last year year and a half um, may may start to shift and change over time. Okay. I think um, what the, there is there is a perspective that is that that is um, in the um, that is in the ecosystem that that cyber is not insurable and the perspective that perspective is is held by uh, you know a number of different individuals because they um, you know they, they believe that um, I don't know if you if you look at the, the the catastrophe scenarios right it's you know what if AWS is down for 60 days mm-hmm. right or, you know what if, what if Google goes down for three months by the way if Google's go- if Google goes down for three months we're gonna have problems than, than just the mm. cyber insurance yeah, cases. Yeah, right? But, yeah. I, you know, I, I think those perspectives um, fail to understand the technical network and infrastructure that AWS and Google have invested billions of dollars in over the last, over, you know, over the last decade, 
right? And, and the redundancies that are in place to, to that, that would make such an event um, a really just an almost impossible occurrence, right? So, yeah, Coalition came out earlier this year, uh, you know, and, and, and put out a white paper um, outlining our perspective on how cyber risk is insured. Right now, our, 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 again, our perspective is that, um, is that uh, active insurance, the, like the element of, uh, you know, of, of providing insurance where um, you're making, uh, you're, you're, you're delivering um, cybersecurity capabilities and improving the, you know, the cyber posture of customers is, is critical to that, uh, you know, to, to, to the, the, the go forward success of the industry. Right? I mean, I, I think, uh, you know, gone are the days when, you know, a person can make a decision uh, on cyber risk from reviewing an application and under and understanding, uh, you know, that, 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 that is, that that's the way that's going to go. Right. Um, there is so much technology that is going to be helpful towards underwriters and individuals making that decision um, over time. So, I mean, I, I think it's, it will be interesting to see where the, where the environment goes, but we absolutely believe that co the coverage is, is insurable. Uh, and, you know, we, we've incorporated that uh, into, into our pricing model and our underwriting philosophy and into the strategy of the company in the future. Awesome. Well, this has been a Sam. This has been a fantastic conversation. But before I let you go, let's just kind of take off the uh, the hat as far as insurance concerned. So tell me, Sam, when you're not working and selling cyber insurance or preaching the gospel of coalition, what are you doing? Yeah. So so um, love to stay active. Uh, I'm a I'm a runner. Um, fun 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 fact. Maybe not so fun fact is that. In the last two months, I've torn both of my calves while running. Oh Lord! <laughs> yeah, tore, tore the left one, recovered, and then tore the right one. Again. So uh, <laughs> you, know, uh, you can you can you can tell that I'm I'm quickly approaching forty. But oh Lord! I uh, know I get it. Stay 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 active. Uh, my kids keep me very busy. It's it's interesting. You know, you mentioned I've traveled a bit, and where the kids grew up have a, a had a, a massive um, implication on on them and 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 their lives. I think. Uh, my my daughter spent a couple of years in London when she when she was small, and so is very into um, art, music, museums, okay. um, the English language, and all the all the all the fun that you can have with that. Uh, and my son was born in the Chicago suburbs right after we came back from London, and is the typical all American kid. And you can always catch him playing football, basketball, soccer, baseball, nice. um, all, all all the rest of it. Right. So my kids keep me on my toes, but love to stay active, um, explore, um, hike with my wife and family. Um, play play a little poker uh, right. and enjoy a nice craft beer uh, or an espresso. Uh, okay, right here, right? Very uh, good. Very good. Yeah, when, when you got the opportunity. Excellent. So, with respects to yeah, if someone's out there wanting to know, you know, more about cyber insurance or just where the, the trend lines are, are, do you have any? Well, across as far as are there any influence that you like as far as uh, columnists? podcasters that you enjoy? I mean, who would you, who would you try to point to in the right direction so that people can get a better sense of how this all works? Yeah. Good, good, good question. Ron. I mean, I like what, you know, my, my, my podcast list uh, and, and reading list is, is around general technology. I mean, I, I would, I would point individuals to, to, to that first, right. Uh, yeah. and, 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 you know, whether, whether it's the journal or the, or the, or the times to, you know, depending on, depending on preference. Right. Um, but, but um, you know, or, or specific industry blogs, you know, tech crunch, et cetera. Right. I mean, I, I, I think the, the overall, the overall transition from, you know, kind of analog to digital um, mm -hmm. in, in business has massive implications for, um, you know, just for, or really kind of all aspects of, of corporate strategy and, and, or individual small company strategy and, and running a business. So I, I, I'd, I'd encourage, um, I'd, I'd encourage further, further reading and, and, and insight, you know, in the, in, in the overall tech space, um, just because it, it has so, such a massive implication on how companies do business, um, yeah. regardless of industry right now. I'm into that. No, that's, I think that's, that's, and I think that's probably in you know, my line of work, um, you know, uh, commercial insurance, and I and specifically focus on construction. Uh, construction is like one of those industries. I think that I tell people it's 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 you know I think they'll know this. It's very slow to adapt to new technologies. I think it's you know there's a, there's a sentiment sometimes you're talking to owners or founders, and they you know I've been doing this for 25 years and it's worked well. Why why do I need to change? And um, but I think that's a your your point is well taken in the sense that you know the acceleration of uh, you know, big data, and, and and as a result, who can take that data and analyze it for for the purposes of a you know a business model, whether it be for you know whether it be for 
actually the bad guys who take that business information and try to figure out where, where are vulnerable areas to attack from a cyber perspective with the flip side, it's, you know, carers like you coming up with a different business model to attack people from the bad guys been doing their thing. Um, I'm just curious. So in, as we wrap up here, one of the things it's just like, you can't seem that can't seem to not turn on a, a, a turn a page on or turn a cable on or read a paper or even look at a podcast. It's, it's just AI in regenerative, generative AI. Um, what are your thoughts respects to is I mean, maybe just, just without finding trade secrets, what sort of adoption or use does uh, coalition brings as far as thinking about co um, artificial intelligence. And then as someone who's been in the insurance industry for quite some time, what are your thoughts with respects to how AI might change the way we do things? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, I'll, I'll tackle the, co the coalition piece first. So, I mean, I think, you know, one of, one of the innovations that we've uh, brought to market this year is coalition security labs. So we have a we have a team of fifteen to twenty researchers, um, you know, in both the U.S. and Europe, who are consistently reviewing cyber uh, cyber trends and, and capturing insights on uh, you know, on on vulnerabilities, such that we can feed that information back to our policyholders and their brokers. And so, uh, you know, I think AI has been helpful there in in in, in, in categorizing and understanding uh, categorizing and understanding cyber risk. We're also using AI. Um, to uh, to help brokers more quickly place policies, right? Which I think I think is is critical in the in the, in the SME space, right? And I think we'll continue to explore it as as new use cases evolve and, and as ownership models evolve with that as well. I think the the implications on insurance are uh, are are really interesting. Um, I think pe you know people go people go right to paranoia in this industry a lot, right? <laughs> around around uh, you know, oh, no, yeah, AI yeah. Is, go is is going to take our jobs, and I, I like. I don't. I don't always see it, right? I mean, I think that that um, for, for uh, you know, I, I think I think that there, there were those types of concerns around the internet. I think there are those types of concerns, uh, you know, around um, you know around any sort of, of of productivity enhancement, whether it be robotics, or RPA, or or any of the the other latest innovations. Yeah. But in in my in my view, uh, you know, critical tool to help uh, to help policyholders understand uh, understand cover. Why, I mean, one. One real-world use case that I've seen is 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 um, individuals asking ChatGPT to explain different coverage forms, right? explain coverage forms or coverage terms, and yeah. and give and give insight into hey, what am I actually buying, and what what protection does my you know, does my coverage actually provide, right? Yeah. So I I think uh, you know in 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 my view and I think Coalition's view as well, right? It's it's something that that supplements existing technology processes and resources to 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 help make the experience. Uh, and, and, and you know, uh, better for better for policyholders and, and all stakeholders in the process. Amen. Perfect. Hey, Sam, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your input here. It's um, good to see you're doing well. And I, you know, having some other people I know from the industry have been in coalition. I wish you guys continued success. And uh, yeah, talk to you soon. Awesome. Thank you, Brian. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Thank you. So that uh, concludes our next last episode, most recent episode of Risk On, Risk Off. I mean, this concept of cyber isn't going to go away anytime soon. And, you know, the, the, the perils associated with it, um, you know, like I said, it's, it's like the, the building a better mousetrap. The bad guys come up with an idea. Hopefully insurance can find a solution. Or, you know, this, the, the IT specialists come up with a solution to prevent that from happening again. And it goes on and on and on. And, and I think as we... More and more of our life is connected through internet and internet of things. And as we kind of see, you know, with the, the growth and the adoption of generative AI as a, as a uh, way of a tool, that's only way ways obviously the bad guys can probably start using AI to come after us as well. So as we've talked about insurance a lot and, you know, people have heard me say, you know, hope is not a plan. The cyber risk is not going to waste. The, the key is for us not only just you as individuals, but also as firms to think about your strategies Think about what it is you can do to mitigate that exposure and then constantly sort of evolve your exposures to this out, outside world on a regular basis. Because we could talk about whether it be a business continuity plan or disaster recovery plan for your IT or just your good good best practices for your IT systems. Um, if it doesn't take into account the changes in the business world and the changes in business models and in the evolving technologies, it's quickly become irrelevant. Um, so... On that note, uh, once again, if you uh, we found this informative, if there's a certain topic or individual you'd like to have you see on the show, please put, post on LinkedIn. You can also find these links on my YouTube channel.
Until next time, buddy.